Today on Muscle Car, we're breaking down the Quadrajet. Find out how to rebuild one the right way and why you'd want to. Revamp your garage floor on a budget and take a ride in Chevy's luxury muscle car. Hey, welcome to Muscle Car. They're probably the most made fun of parts ever used. If you got a GM muscle car, chances are it probably came with one. Hey, Quadrajet. Now these carburetors, they've gotten a bad rap for a lot of years. They've been called leaky, unreliable, low performance Quadra junks. And today, we're going to show you guys why you shouldn't believe all the negative hype. Q-Jets, well, they're capable of a lot of horsepower, and they're really not as complicated as you think. If you're doing a stock restoration on your GM, you'll probably be dealing with one. So we'll show you the right way to get one purring like a kitten and roaring like a lion. Rawr! Now the most common type of performance carburetor is probably the Holly. Now Holly and most other carbs use what's known as a square bore design. That means that the primaries and the secondaries are the same size. Now Quadrajet, they use a design that's unlike any other. They use smaller primaries to meet emission standards and give you better gas mileage, but huge secondaries to deliver the kind of performance that muscle car enthusiasts demand. And get this, a bone stock Q-Jet, it can give you up to 800 CFM. There's more than one style Quadrajet. Pontiac, Buick, and Olds use the straight inlet, while Chevrolet used the 90 degree style. The late model carbs are equipped with a throttle position sensor and a mixture control solenoid. The amount of emissions equipment and even the car's options like AC or cruise control can even make a difference. Now, models that came on early big blocks used a bigger bore, therefore they're more desirable. And you can tell this carburetor is apart by the bump inside the primary bore. Now the best way to tell which carburetor you have is by looking at the stamping number on the internet. So why do they have such a bad reputation? If you've got one that's leaky or unreliable, it could be suffering from a bad rebuild or just simply worn out. A lot of people assume that since it's a stock carburetor that it's low performance, but that's just not true. Now we already told you guys that these things are capable of flowing up to 800 CFM. And a properly rebuilt and tuned Quadrajet, well it may just surprise you. Now, as far as being complicated goes, it's probably just the outward appearance that has a tendency to intimidate people. Now honestly, it's not the prettiest carburetor out there, but once you know the basics, they're really no more complicated than any other carb. When tearing down for a rebuild, first remove all the external parts, fuel inlet, choke pull-off, idle stop solenoid, and choke thermostat. When tapping out the roll pin for the accelerator pump lever, be sure to leave a little room behind the pin. This will make it much easier to reinstall. Next, remove the choke flap lever. Disassemble the top plate from the main body. Remove all nine screws, including the two inside the primary bore, then carefully pry it off. If yours has been sitting around as long as this one has, you may want to watch out for critters inside. Now, you can completely disassemble the main body. Finally, remove the base plate from the main body. Remove the two retaining screws, the air fuel mixture screws, then pry it off. Hang on to the gasket for now. We'll tell you why later. The base plate, main body, and top plate are all ready to be cleaned. So I'm gonna give it a bath while we're gone to break. But when we get back, we're gonna continue this Q-Jet makeover. Hey, welcome back. I soaked our Quadrajet for over an hour, scrubbed it with a brush, rinsed it out, blew it off with some air. To give these old parts that stock look, I'm going to give the top plate and the main body a quick coat of this Eastwood Carb Renew. This paint is designed for the outside of the carb only, so try to keep as much off the inside as possible. While we wait for the paint to dry, I'm going to get working on the base plate. Now one of the main things that can really cause problems with a Q-Jet is a worn primary shaft. Now it's real commonly overlooked during the rebuild, but I'll tell you, it can make tuning one of these things just about impossible. Now we're going to repair this one with a bushing kit, but first I need to disassemble it and clean it by blasting it. It's a good idea to label the flaps. They are side specific and you don't want to get them mixed up.
With the flaps removed, the throttle shafts slide right out. I'm giving the base plate a quick blasting before reassembly. A wire brush and some elbow grease will work fine too. Next, I'll drill out the throttle shaft boards to make room for the repair bushings. Now the idea here is to only drill it as far as the bushing is going to set in there. That way you have a lip that will prevent that bushing from falling all the way through and ending up in there against your throttle blades. That's what that piece of tape is there for. It's a depth guide. I'm using a brass hammer here to keep from damaging the bushings like a steel hammer might. Some WD-40 on some thousand grit smooths away any leftover funk. With everything cleaned up, the shafts can slide back in place, along with the fast idle levers and spring. Now with the bushings installed, you can see that took up all the slack out of our shaft, so we don't have to worry about a vacuum leak there anymore. The next thing to check for is to make sure that on wide open throttle, your blades are sitting to 90. Now it looks good. Another common problem of the Quadrajets are the leaking bottom plugs. It's not that hard of a repair. Some simple homemade plugs and some epoxy and a little bit of time, get it fixed, no problem. First, drill out the old plugs, making sure not to go too deep. Tap out the holes with a bottoming tap, and then mix up some epoxy. I already made a pair of plugs by chopping up some half-inch bolts. A quick dip in the epoxy will seal the threads. A dab on the top seals the deal. Once our epoxy dries, we can assemble our main body to the base plate. Now always save your old gaskets, cause carburetor kits usually come with an assortment. Try to keep them in one piece, that way it's a lot easier to match them up. That's it. This is the easy part. Just two screws attach the base plate back to the main body. I'm taking some thousand grip to the pump and power piston boards to remove any imperfections. Now we're ready to install the primary jets. I like to replace these when doing a rebuild because just like the throttle shaft, they're probably worn also. Now they come in a lot of different sizes, but Elderbrock's calibration kit has got a big assortment. You won't know what size you need until you get into the carburetor, but doesn't matter which one you have, this kit has got you covered. After installing the jets, I'm using an old check ball and a punch to reform the seat before installing the new one. One of the performance upgrades you can do to help out an old quad jet is to simply swap out the needle and seat assembly with a high flow unit like the one supplied in our calibration kit. What this does is helps keep the carburetor from running out of fuel at wide open throttle. When doing a rebuild, I always like to swap out the float for a new one. Sometimes it's easy to tell when they're bad, other times not so much. And for about seven bucks, that's some pretty cheap insurance. Once the new float is in place, I need to set the level. This kit includes a chart showing what the level should be for your model. Adjust by bending the arm. It's very important to get an accurate level or you're just wasting your time. Next, the power valve and primary metering rods drop in and the float splash guard and gasket go on. Another performance upgrade for the Quadrajet is either to swap out or simply shorten the accelerator pump. What this does is it increases the pump volume during quick movement of the throttle. These brass tubes have been known to fall out, so I'm keeping them in place with a few light taps of a hammer. Use Loctite on the flap screws because you don't want them to back out, fall through the carb, and wind up inside your engine. For the final assembly, reattach the top plate and all the external components you removed on disassembly. So that's one way to spruce up an old Quadrajet. 
This was a stock rebuild with a couple of exceptions, but there's plenty of performance parts available out there if you need to go more in that direction. So I'm gonna go bolt this on my old Buick GS, try it out. But stay tuned, there's a lot more muscle car coming up. Up next, personal luxury car or muscle car. With this Chevy, you don't have to choose. Today's flashback, a 1970 Monte Carlo SS. Monte Carlo for 1970. The new one from Chevrolet at a Chevrolet price. The new Monte Carlo is shown here with uh, all other cars in its field. The Monte Carlo really was one of a kind when it debuted in 1970. Personal luxury cars like the Grand Prix and Thunderbird were the hot item. But one thing you couldn't get in those rides was some real muscle. This luxury car had plenty of that to go around. But well, when you turn it into a super sport, first, you got one of Chevy's biggest and baddest engines. A 360 horsepower turbojet 454. It cranked out a whopping 500 pound feet of torque, giving it plenty of giddy up. To handle the extra power, the suspension was beefed up along with the rubber. G70 wide ovals wrapped around 15 by 7 inch wheels. Turbo hydromatic transmission was mandatory with the SS package. You also got dual chrome tipped exhaust with half inch larger pipes. Plus a super lift load leveling system which automatically balanced the car when you had friends riding in the back seat. Arrgh. SS markings were discreet with small badges only on the rocker panel. This money is also loaded with a bunch of extras like a sports steering wheel, strato bucket seats, a gauge cluster with a tack, remote control sport mirror, and rally wheels. Since it was a luxury car, it had things like concealed wipers, higher quality nylon seats, faux wood trim, and lots of soundproofing material, giving it a curb weight of over two tons. The Monte Carlo was dreamed up as Chevy's version of the redesigned 69 Grand Prix. Using the Chevelle's 116-inch wheelbase as its starting point, the firewall was moved back and the nose extended, which resulted in the longest hood ever on a Chevrolet, nearly six feet. With the engine sitting further back, it was well suited for NASCAR, which it joined in 71. Styling was based on the Cadillac Eldorado, but used more muscular fenders with beveled edges. It shared the same windshield, rear window and deck lid as the Chevelle, but had wider C-pillars and a slightly larger rear end. Single headlights replaced the Chevelle's dual setup, and the egg crate grille had a distinctive Monte Carlo crest in the center. Only the 70 and 71 models had the year embossed in Roman numerals. The car debuted in September of 1969, and the public loved it. By the end of the following year, 146,000 were on the road, outselling its rival the T-Bird by three to one margin. Only about 3,800 got the SS treatment though, probably due to sticker shock. Monty started out at 3,100 bucks, but a fully loaded one like this would jack the price up to over five grand, a thousand more than a Chevelle SS. Supersports didn't fare any better in 71, with less than 2,000 sold, so Chevy deleted the option in 72. The muscle car era was winding down, and Chevy felt the package clashed with the car's luxury image. It would be 11 years before the SS returned to breathe new life into the brand and help put Montes at the top of the heap on the NASCAR circuit. The 1970 Monte Carlo SS stands out today as a car that combined luxury and muscle into one impressive package. Coming up, how to transform your garage floor in just a weekend. Hey guys, welcome back. You know, they say a man's home is his castle. If you're a car guy, your garage is your castle. Now, I don't care how many cool posters and old license plates you hang on the wall. If the floor looks bad, the whole place is going to look bad. Now, you can call a pro to come in and code it for you, but that can run into some big bucks. So I'm going to show you how to get a floor like this and still have enough money left over to park something on it. Build on a budget. Muscle car projects that save you time and money. Now, coating a cement floor yourself is actually a lot cheaper than you might think. 
This epoxy floor coating from You Coat It will handle a two and a half car garage and run you less than 250 bucks. And once you have all the prep work done, you can have a good looking, long lasting floor in less than a weekend. Now we've had you coated on the shop floor for years and it's held up fantastic. But our paint mixing room on the other hand, well it's never been coated and it's looking pretty sad. So I'm going to seal it all up and get it looking better than new. Prepping out the floor is extremely important. Start by sweeping or vacuuming up all the dirt. Next, check to see if your concrete has a sealer. Pour straight muriatic acid on the floor. If nothing happens, you'll need to strip off the sealer before you go any further. If it bubbles, you can move on to the next step. Spray or hose it down with plain water and look for any beading. Uh, yep, it's beading up right there. It's going to have to get cleaned. Beating means contamination. Thoroughly clean these spots with a degreaser and a brush. Now once it's clean, neutralize the alkalinity of the floor with a muriatic acid solution. Be sure to wear protection and keep the area well ventilated. A thorough rinsing comes next. A little baking soda in the water helps neutralize the acid. Go over the floor two or three times, leaving it wet but with no puddles or standing water. Apply the epoxy bond coat to the wet concrete using a W pattern. Make sure the concrete stays wet during application to ensure good penetration. Well, that's it. All we have to do now is let this dry for about four or six hours, put on our second coat. This coat goes on just like the first. Remember, you have a 72 hour window or you'll be sanding between coats. Hey, check it out, man. Our new floor looks awesome. Plus, it's going to last for years. Not to mention the fact should make cleaning up those little spills a whole lot easier. I'm going to try to not put that theory to the test and mix up some paint for our next project. But for this week, we're out of time. So until next time, we're out of here.